Lovely. All right, all right. Welcome back, Sports Medicine Project people, to another episode. Now, very special guest, and I'm going to tell a little bit of a story a little bit later on, but I'm going to introduce our lovely guest, Ian Griffiths. Mate, how, how are you going? I'm well. I'm well. Thanks for having me, both of you. I, I want to know what this story is. I don't think I can wait till later. What's going on? All right. Oh, yeah, I'll set the scene. I'll set the scene. So <laughs> I'm going to set the scene for our lovely listeners there. And I know it's a lot of younger clinicians and students, which we, well, I wasn't too long ago, but I've just left university. It's the, so over here, it's Christmas to like February where we get our registration. So we're in Lowell. So we're not allowed to practice, but we're about to start work. And I've just left uni, really loving biomechanics and sports podiatry. I was a big believer in, you know, pronation is the cause of all injury over pronation, not the, I guess, an understanding of the complexity of pain and injury. And I actually found your page and heard about you in that break and started listening to some of your your content, a bit of pod chat live, some of your Instagram. And I thought, wow, this is really different to anything that I've heard, but it makes a lot of sense. And then from there, it was kind of the the start of my journey, I guess, as a, a well-rounded podiatrist. So you were the, I guess what I would call the first modern podiatrist that I ever heard of where yes, biomechanics matter, but in the sense of, you know, the, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. So I've got to thank you for that. <laughs> thank you it's really kind i like hearing the word modern because it makes me feel less old than i actually am so that's delightful to hear <laughs> <laughs> the modern and young podiatrist and the, the michael yeah. jordan of podiatry in my eyes <laughs> <laughs> definitely not but no I, I think, thank you that's really kind it's good to know that someone out there's reading and listening as well right um yeah, I'm always, uh, <laughs> yeah i'll take it i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get cracking, but I just wanted to, to ask whereabouts are you at the moment? Right now I'm in my, my front room, which is, uh, in Hertfordshire in England. It's just about an hour North of London. Uh, in England. Okay. I don't know if you guys have ever been over. Um, but yeah, if we say London, then yeah, you know, you got a rough idea. I was of where just we about are. to say, you've almost got to kind of add that on to the end. And when we was talking to other international guests from, from the UK, they've said, and they'll say, and I go, oh yeah, and I'm kind of nodding going, please say how far that is from London, because that's where I know <laughs> kind of where it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm an hour from London. So I live out, I live in Hertfordshire, but I practice in London. So yeah, London's yeah. fine. Yeah. And it's 10 p.m. where you are, hey? It is, yes, just gone 10 p.m. Yeah, that's commitment. Yeah. I, I'm asleep by like 8.30 every night, so I just can't fathom that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I said to you just before we came live, I said I was I was thinking of making up a story that I'd cancelled some really elaborate plans to do this, but I promise you I haven't. This is, you know, I will talk, I will talk this stuff any time, any day of the week that anyone will have me. So, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. That's passion. You know, 10 p.m. <laughs> Saturday night, that's what podiatrists should be doing, talking podiatry out in the world to anyone that wants to listen. <laughs> is, is it passion or is it sad? It's probably somewhere in between, but, yeah. <laughs> so, so what got you into podiatry? And tell us tell us your story, Ian. Yeah, I will. Um Cut me off. I'm known for being a rambler. So cut me. I'll try and give you the short version. Um, but it wasn't something I um, particularly grew up wanting to be, or, or if I'm honest, grew up knowing what it was. And I don't think that's an uncommon thing either. Certainly not in the UK. I had my heart set on being a pharmacist. Um, and I don't know if Blake's heard any of my, or Kelly, you may have heard them too. I, I, when I go analogies, I, I go pharmacology analogies a yes. lot. Yeah. And that's, I think that's my little throwback to what, what my original sort of thought process about what my career would be. So I finished my A-levels, uh, didn't do great in chemistry, which you could argue is a problem um, for someone wanting to do pharmacy. And it was. <laughs> so I, I didn't get into university. So I went and um did like a vocational like a bit like an apprenticeship like a diploma where you work in a pharmacy in a hospital for four days a week and then you go to college one day a week and you do that for two years and you end up with a diploma in pharmaceutical science so my first ever sort of qualification was in pharmaceutical science and then I decided I'm going to use that to go to uni to study pharmacy and when I applied they said no, you still need A-level chemistry, um, which was a problem. So I went to night school deciding, OK, I'm going to just do this. I'm going to knuckle down. Uh, I was working all day and then I went to night school to study chemistry. And day one, I'm sitting there five minutes into this three hour night school lecture. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do this. I, I love physics. I love yeah. biology. I just can't stand chemistry. Um, and I chatting to the chap next to me, who's, who's about my age at this time. We're only now I don't know, uh, very early tw 20, I think we were at 1920. 21 and um 
I said, what's your story? And he he said, oh, um, I'm going to study podiatry. Yeah, I said, what's that? I'd never heard of it. And he said, well, uh, you know, I said, why are you here doing chemistry? Like, do you need chemistry for that? He said, no, no, I just, I've been out of school. I left school when I was 18, like three years ago. And all my university want, when I'm, that I'm applying to is to see that I've recently studied something scientific. So evidence of recent study. And this is the only one that basically fits my weekly timetable. Uh, and for the next three hours, instead of listening to the, the chemistry lecture at the front, I, I turned to this chap, I was like, tell me more about this podiatry then, what's the deal? I got a three hour pitch. He told me everything about what it is. You can study children and you can study sports injuries and biomechanics and you can go on to do podiatric surgery. And I left this three hour lecture thinking, well, that's it. Like, I'm going to be one of those. Um, went home, you know, uh, sent, um, sent an email and basically to a couple of podiatry schools, telling them what qualifications I had at the time. Uh, and they went, we'll, we'll take you tomorrow. So uh, this, and I, I, this, here's the crazy thing. Like, I don't know who this guy was. I didn't, I don't remember his name. I don't know if he went on to study podiatry. We are talking 1999. So we're looking at 20, what's that coming up 24 years ago. He may well be a podiatrist of 20 years, same as I am now. I don't know if he is, I don't know if he isn't, but this stranger three hours next to him literally went, took me from pharmacy, podiatry next September I started, uh, never regretted it a single day since. That's and that's my story. And I know, you crazy, right? Like a whole career as well, and presenting at conferences and podcasts and things, all from this this one guy. Surely, I mean, hopefully, he's a podiatrist, and just one day is like, just sees your face on this conference and goes, "Oh, I know this guy." <laughs> I sat next to him I, a few years ago. I, yeah, I've told, I've started telling this story recently when people ask me, in the hope that if he is, he'll be yeah. like, "I'm that." I, I remember talking to that guy because, yeah, he's given me a career that I love. I, yeah. I, you know, I'm incredibly passionate about it. It. It gives me as much as I give it. It's allowed me to travel the world. I don't know that pharmacy would have ever done that for me. Um, it's still my first love, but it's like, I guess, you know, it's like your first love at school and then you, you know, they're always in your in your mind, but they don't end up becoming your wife. Like, the, the, you know, podiatry is my wife, my work wife, but it's not, it wasn't my first <laughs> love, but that's probably a horrible analogy, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Your wife's in the next room going, what did he just say? I know. I, you, know <laughs> you know, I should just, I should just stick to the pharmacology analogies. I think. I, I, I yeah. Think <laughs> yeah. Incredible. It's funny you say that though, also, because you were tossing between pharmacy yeah, and that's, a pharmacist or a podiatrist. Yeah. I actually, um, I, I did my oh, first really? uni and I was enrolled in pharmacy up until two weeks until the university, like the semester started. And and I was like, I just want to do something a little bit more hands on. I always had podiatry in my mind and it was one of my preferences, but I um, was enrolled in pharmacy, ready to start. And I thought, I just I want to do something more hands on and then end up going into podiatry. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. I, I think, I, I think reflecting back now, knowing what, how much I get to interact with people um, and that wouldn't necessarily have been the case, uh, you know, in the world of, of pharmaceutical science, um, mm. it's absolutely the right choice for me and my personality, I think. Yeah, mm. definitely. So um, we'll, we'll get cracking with the very first question, which is probably the funnest question and the one that's probably going to be the most um, maybe debate over because everyone's got a different answer. But being a podiatrist, knowing all the things you know about shoes and by judging from your Instagram, you've got about 4,000 shoes. You'd have to have a shoe room in your house. What is your favorite running shoe and why? Yeah, I do have a shoe room. It's not, a it's the study, but it's, it's study slash shoe room. And it's, it's contentious in my household because my wife's got me on a one in one out policy now. Oh, so when you shoot, mm -hmm. you do it, you rolling that, that, that role, that method as well. When one pair comes in, I have to either give a pair to a friend or give a pair to charity or, or throw a pair away. I tend to, mm -hmm. tend to do the one of the former two. Um, so yeah, I think I've got about 70 pairs, something like that. Um, what's my favorite? Um, it varies. I, you know, it, it depends on, on, the day it depends on the weather it depends on what yeah. session i've got planned but generally speak and we've never had more choice right you know this um mm. we've just never had much more, more choice uh for me now the fact that these high stack high drop stiff rocker shoes are fashionable and trendy and uh, uh, you know mainly for performance reasons i know but the fact that they are so readily accessible in every different brand is is delightful to me because that that really suits my anatomy it really suits my my structural setup, my my anatomical deficits. So um, I love those shoes. So uh, they're all, I'm not a good enough runner to really delineate between one or the other. So I love the New Balance range. Originally it was the TC, then it was the RC. Now it's the SC or the Super Comp. Yeah. Um, I love the Metaspeed 
range from ASICs. I love the endorphin range from Sokoni, the speed and the pro, not so much the shift. Um, so, you know, if you, if you listen to all those shoes, what you realize, and you know these shoes well, I know both of you, um, I've described really similar shoes there. Like they're more similar than they are different, right? Um, before, when I started running, I only started on my 40th birthday. I'm 44 now, just for context. So I was late to it. Football as in soccer and golf were my sports. And then I had a midlife crisis at 40 and, and switched to running. And um, I started in the Adidas Boston Boost yeah. because four years ago, there was no, you know, the shoe, there were the shoes I've just mentioned weren't even available. And I loved that Boston Boost. But then mm -hmm. once I felt the the stiff rock of the high stack of, you know, the, mod the modern shoes that I've just described, I put my boost on the other day for, you know, like old time's sake and um, thinking, oh, they're, these are going to feel like a like an old friend, like a pair of slippers. I went out for just like six miles or so. Um, I just hated every step of it. <laughs> it, it, it. Yeah, so I know you've spoken yeah. to Nitta uh, about this and, I, you know, Nitta's a good friend of mine and we we talk shoes, we nerd out on shoes. And, and he was one of the first people that said to me and, and it really made me realise it's so true when we talk about what, what feels comfortable and, we, you know, I know lots of people place different emphasis on the importance of comfort. But um, when we talk about generally some, what's comfortable, what we forget is that 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 changes, you know, that 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 changes. It was different between person, but it's different within person, not just over the same kind of week, but over months and months and months. So what you I know Nitta's talked about going back to old shoes he used to love. And he just doesn't love them anymore because his comfort filters or his comfort mm -hmm. dial has moved based on what he's been wearing in recent months. So it's another reason I try and get as men, my feet into as many shoes as possible, not just to experience them and feel them. And then when patients inevitably say, does that shoe is that shoe true to size does it come up half a size big or does that is that rocker aggressive or stiff i want to know kind of like even though if what i how i answer those questions isn't necessarily what they will think at least it gives me you know in my opinion that rocker is really stiff and aggressive mm. or in my opinion that rocker is a bit too distal or a bit too you know i like to have that sort of ability to impart first-hand knowledge rather than just what i've read but also yeah. i like to get my feet in as many shoes as possible so i can constantly keep tweaking my own sort of sensitivity dial to these things um do you want one yeah i think one shoe right now for example the one i'd reach for on race day that's the important thing right mm, that's if had, I, yeah if i had a race coming up and i look at all the shoes i've got on my rack what do i reach for it's it's the next percent uh, vapor, it's the nike next percent two yeah, okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, good shoe. I don't tend to. I, I don't tend to do many threshold or tempo or interval sessions in it, but I tend to reach for it on race day, mostly because I run in a lot of Nike vests and I like my shoes. I like. I've got borderline. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm particular about things. I, I like to. Have, if I'm wearing Nike top, I like to have Nike on my feet. And you know, like, uh, if I decide I'm going to wear my, uh, I don't have much Asics kit, so I can't tend to wear my Asics on race day. It just doesn't. You know, just a weird thing about me. But yeah, next percent's a race day shoe for sure. Would that um, does that change depending on the distance or any distance? I, so unlike you guys, I'm not. I don't go beyond half marathons. So I'm you know five k, ten k, half, and um, yeah, I wear it for all. I think it's I think it's uh, for me at least. It, it does the job um, across all those three. I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, most of my friends that use it for marathons are normally done in about two twenty. So you know. <laughs> The, the, I, I don't look to them for advice because uh, the reality is if I did a marathon, I suspect I'd be on my feet for much closer to four hours. And I don't know that the next percent for four hours would feel super, super great on my feet. Um, then again, I don't think anything would after four hours, to be honest. Yeah. I'm actually two weeks out from a marathon. Funny you say that. Where uh, first, what, are you what, what are you going for? What, what, what are you going to put on your feet? I'm going to wear the Sorconi Endorphin Speeds. I think they'll nice. be more comfortable over the 42. Yeah. I agree. I think my feet would be so uncomfortable in the vapor flies for a, a marathon. Like them for the half, but no more than that. Mm. Yeah, that's a cracking shoe as well, isn't it? Yeah, what are you going to Just got a pair of the Vivo barefoot. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I just, um, they're coming hopefully tomorrow, the Alpha Fly 2s. I'm going to give them a go. Al Alpha Fly, interesting. Do you like the Alpha Fly 1 then? or? I haven't, I haven't tried it. Uh, see, I. I I, I'm not a fan. I didn't uh, controversial. I, I didn't like it at all. Oh, don't tell um, me that. Because I thought if Kipchoge can run under two hours, surely I can. It'll work for me. We're a pretty similar build ish. Similar, similar. You're, you're almost, you know, almost identical. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> What's the same? Do you um? I, I do want to ask because I, I definitely find and I um, was talking to Nitter about this as well. Like in using carbon plated shoes, 
to have like therapeutic effect in the clinic as well. Do you do you tend to see any use case for them clinically and like using them and recommending them to patients for, you know, big toe OA or ankle OA and things like that? And do you think there's any harm in running in them long term? Because you've got a little bit of research to say it, you know, reduces the workload at the first MTP and the calf and things. Um, do you, yeah, what, what do you think? Uh, yeah, so to answer the first question of the two there, uh, yeah, we absolutely uh, recommend uh, not necessarily like a, a vapor fly clinically, because if someone comes in and they're, um, you know, they've got, I don't know, uh, any any kind of forefoot load issues. So, you know, we, we you know, a stiff rocker, um, and, you know, and it doesn't have to have a carbon plate to, to come under that definition, but a stiff rocker will do a wonderful job of offloading the forefoot, whether it be first MTPJ, OA, second MTPJ synovitis plantar plate tear um even morton's neuroma actually um or into my i should say intermetatarsal neuroma i should say um yeah. uh, i found that stiff rocker shoes are, are wonderful even just walking around are offloading them but if you don't have a pair if, if i see a runner and they have a pair already we say okay you know instead of just wearing them once a week for sessions like walk to work in them for a bit you know walk to work in them for the next three four five weeks if someone doesn't have a pair Throwing out over two hundred pounds, mm. sorry, I can't do I can't do the dollar conversion, but yeah, um, throwing out that kind of money for a therapeutic effect, I don't, and if particularly if they're a non-runner, they're just not going to do it. But we still recommend stiff rocker, like so. The Asics Glide Ride mm. uh, comes in comes in here at about eighty pounds now. So you know, you sort of say to people, look, this is going to be so much more effective at offloading, you know, a sensitive forefoot than than orthoses ever would, for example. Um, and also she's the 300 pounds and the glide rise is 80 pounds. And, you know, I say to them, look, this is a great shoe to wear for a few weeks to settle things down. It's not a life sentence, pop it then back in the wardrobe. Um, and you know, it's there if you need it, just the same way, you know, you don't take paracetamol every day, just in case you get a headache. But if you wake up with a headache, here's my pharmacy, pharmacy analogies again, you wake up with a headache and you pop a couple of paracetamol. Well, if you, you know, if you wake up in the foot sore, reach for the glide ride that day so it's a lovely tool uh so yeah we, we absolutely use stiff rocker shoes not necessarily carbon plated uh, therapeutically now more so than ever because they're more available to us than ever mm -hmm. um the second part of the question was do i think uh there's a possible cost i think of of wearing carbon or you know training and wearing carbon mm -hmm. plated shoes um we don't know as you, you know i know you know this already we don't know um but it feels to you know, there's a couple of things that feel too good to be true and one is that we know that you can't cheat physics so if you're if we can successfully wear a shoe and reduce load in location a then you know it's a zero sum game if we've reduced load in location a we've increased it in location b c or d or somewhere else so we might have robbed peter to pay paul so if you know reducing load somewhere has to put it somewhere else so i, th I think it's foolish for us to say that might not come at a cost and the other thing that i can't shake the shake the feeling of and it's just a feeling is that i don't think there's any debate now that these shoes improve performance and improve running economy i don't think you know i don't think it's unreasonable to say we all agree that now um almost everything i've ever come across that dramatically improves performance you know, as you dial up things to really really maximize performance what you tend to find is that you might if, if performance goes up, then so will your injury risk. Now, again, we know if we really, really optimize someone for being really, really low risk of injury, if we think we could achieve that, it's highly likely we'd reduce their chances of having really, really high performance as well. I just, I think it's too good to be true that performance maximization and injury minimization can come from one thing. It feels to me like, um, like if you're setting yourself up to be perfectly, if we think about how the best performers in the world, they're constantly treading that line and pushing you know walking right up to that boundary and we know there, there you know greater injury risk comes with all the things we do to maximize our performance so i don't know for sure but i feel like i feel like it, it could be the case um yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I like i love i love the research that's coming out at the moment but it was all still very very sort of running economy focused and how do these shoes work focused and i just don't think we have because they've only been out four or five years right we just don't have the longitudinal data available to us yet so it's going to be fun i mean let me ask you guys a question as you know you've just mentioned to me you're both doing a marathon and you're both wearing a shoe with a plate in it although kelly's is nylon not carbon fiber obviously but we all, all three of us wear carbon plated shoes we're all we're enjoying them because they feel great to run in they're fun 
and you know all those things if research came up tomorrow and said by the way these dramatically increase your risk of injury would do you think would we stop wearing them i don't know that i would i think i would because i've been notoriously injured in the last in my running career which has been since i was like 16 years old i don't think i've had 12 months where i haven't had a niggle so if i found that out i would but that's just based off my injury history, I think. And my yeah. reason for running is because I love it, not because I want to perform at a, a really high level. I just want to be able to run sustainably for as long as I can. So that's my answer. You? Uh, I I would still run in them because I, I, I really think that, and again, this is all hypothetical, I think you can somehow mitigate the effects with consistent high, like heavy resistance strength training and proper load modification. But we don't know that either. I know we don't know that, but that's definitely what I think. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to, I'll be in the spare room again tonight. Let's we'll start here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't think I, I would. What about yourself? No, I definitely wouldn't. Absolutely mm-hmm. not. Um, like I say, I've, I've finally found shoes that really suit my anatomy. I, I, they're, they're super comfy. They're, mm-hmm. they're so much fun to run in. Like I say, the fact I'm almost the performance benefits from them are almost the, the smallest reason I wear them, to be honest. Uh, I'd still wear them if there was no performance benefits from them. I wear them because I really, really, I yeah. find they just ma- marry with me so well. And like, you know, if we run, our, in, our re, you know, our risk of running injury if we run is always greater than zero, right? So yeah, let's just have fun along this, you know, let's have fun along the way. Yeah, and you do look good. And if someone sees you coming in bright shoes, I'm, I'm thinking yeah. to myself, they reckon I'm the best runner ever. And I always pick up the pants a little bit. I'm like, if you're wearing those shoes, you got to look like you're quick. And then when they're not looking, I'll just slow it down a bit. It's, Mate, um, when you've got the, when you've got those alpha flies on, they won't see you coming. They'll hear you coming. <laughs> yeah, I'm a heavy hitter. <laughs> it's funny what you said earlier about the the you know the lack of research out there that. Uh, sort of can definitively say if carbon plated shoes uh, have a cost to wearing them all the time and you know your your answer that there probably is a cost of wearing them all the time it's it's interesting because every everyone that we've had on the podcast with um, you know a similar level of expertise such as Simon Bartold and Nita and um, they, they've all sort of agreed the same thing so it's it's funny how you know we have these ideas and it makes sense but we just can't prove it I guess. Yeah. I'm glad after a minute, I thought you were going to say that all those aforementioned uh, experienced guys had a different opinion to me and I was about to backtrack. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say everyone has the same idea. It makes, it makes total sense, doesn't it? But it's just not out there where we can definitively say that that's the case. Yeah. Holding, um, holding on the topic of shoes, this is a, and this is, I know, and I'm, I'm not sure if they're still teaching this in the podiatry program in the UK, but how much do you think like the shoe categories hold merit? Like the, and we're talking, I guess we could talk in the two categories of in the asymptomatic population and in someone in pain. Do you think flatter or pronated feet benefit from having stability shoes? And, you know, on that, is there still the category of stability, neutral and cushion or have kind of moved away from that and we're just back to, you know, kind of tissue stress theory? Yeah, the categories um, over here, they still exist in in so much that uh, I'm not saying they they have strong, um, they, they certainly have people who, who speak out against them. Um, but the reality is if you go into most running shops over here, and you go into most websites to buy a shoe, and it may well be the same in Oz. Um, mm. Correct me if it's not, but you you still essentially say, okay, I'm looking at new, you know, can I can I see all the neutral shoes on the website? Or can I look at all the stability yeah. shoes? You go into the store, and you know, the, the neutral shoes are all there under with the, with the banner, and then the stability. And I think they exist um, to try and make something easier, mm. easier for the consumer, for the runner, easier for the person, you know, the retailer, um, you know if it really comes down to the nuts and bolts of it, and we're going to be scientists about this and we say, okay, what, how do we define a, you know, a stability shoe? I don't think there's massive agreement on that. Um, so if we just use the, yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is the shoe categories, I, I feel like they've never been more blurred as well. So we look at shoes traditionally that would be described as cushioned and they'd be shoes that had a very uh, thick or, or very compliant, soft midsole, traditionally EVA, but we've got lots of other foams available now. So we look at the Nike Invincible, and um, it comes under that definition. It's really thick, it's really compliant, it's really soft, it's super comfy, 
anyway, I don't know if you've both run in it. It's, it's mm. no doubt it feels cushioned under your feet. And you look at it on, on the websites and in retail and it's described as a cushion shoe. But it behaves quite stably because of its width. So we, you know, we, we now look at it and go, well, what is this shoe? Is it a stability shoe? Is it a cushion shoe? Because um, it's soft, but it behaves quite in a, quite a stable manner. Um, so I think we, we, we look at the categories as, as a way of trying to simplify things. But as we always know, just we simplify it, but it doesn't mean it's right. Um, and then we were in that big debate of should we do things that are right um, at the cost of confusing people? So I love the idea. I'm sure you've seen it of, uh, you know, uh, Blaise Dubois and J.F. Esculio and JFAR a few years ago did something called the Minimalist Index, where it was just for minimal shoes, um, but essentially, you know, brought up a way to say, how can we define, you know, a scale of what minimalist shoes are from, you know, uh, from based on their design features. So I, I wonder whether we're perhaps moving one day towards somewhere where we say, no such thing as neutral, no such thing as stability, but let's take, you know, shoe design feature A, like shoot, you know, um, stack height. Um, and it's a sliding scale from very high all the way down to very low. Then we take drop very high to very low. Then we take, um, you know, four foot width very high to very low, you know, toe spring angle very high. And then basically every single shoe, you just see where does it sit on this scale, on this spectrum um, for each given feature. And then there really comes a time for me where I don't, you know, I've described the shoes that I like, but I haven't described them as neutral or stability. I've described them with regards mm -hmm. to the stack and the drop and the rocker that I like. And if we can then tailor what, what features we think people like or need, depending on whether they're symptomatic or not, then you can say, okay, I think you need a wide forefoot. I think you need a high drop because of, you've got a previous history of, of calf problems. Um, yeah, you, know, you, you, you sell, you say to us that you, you um, rate cushioning as an important thing to you that, you know, we look at those three things. We look at where the shoe, what shoes sort of ticks all those boxes. So, more long-winded more complicated but i think it's probably the way that we all we all when we're having chats with patients in clinic and they say what shoe do you think i need because we've got the time and we've had the, the chance to delve into their history and we we get to assess them we can say i think you might do well with shoes that have these kind of features now in the store i don't know that that would work but i think i think we need to move away from categories and move into more sort of that that method if we can um your question about sort of pronated feet and stability shoes it's a tricky one because we all i'm sure i speak for all of us forgive me if you know the royal we um we were all taught pronated feet need to go in stability shoes um i was taught that for sure it sounds yes. like you were blake um certainly yeah. i don't know what physio physio training is like kelly but you're nodding so i'm guessing you were given something along those lines so pronated feet go in stability shoes and then um as you've already said we get to the point where we're like, is pronation you know actually something we should be that concerned about and actually does do pronated feet are they predictive of injury or pain or few and we we know that the answer is uh, certainly not particularly clear and we certainly don't think they're as evil as we once did and then we moved away from that and then we had all those napic uh, military studies that looked at sort of um you know you know took a group of people and said right you've got pronated feet um and let's see you know we're going to give you stability shoes but you know you've got pronated feet and we're just going to give you you know Sure, at random we're not we're, you know we and no injury differences between the two groups whatsoever uh i've horribly summarized a really massive piece of work there of course um so we're like okay pronation doesn't matter and then lauren malasu and his team in luxembourg who i think had done some of the best research mm -hmm. recently uh in recent years and continue to then they published a review that showed that pronated feet uh do better in stability issues they, 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 it lowers the risk of injury so you're like, okay, so now we're, you know, we just, I yeah. think it's a bit like whether we should call a tendinopathy, a tendonitis, a tendinopathy. We keep changing our mind. It's a bit like that. I, the honest answer is I don't know where we're at at the moment. If someone comes into my clinic with what we would call pronated feet by whatever definition you use and they're new to running and they say, what shoe should I have? Do I need a stability shoe? I'm like, <laughs> yeah, maybe, I don't know. But here's the thing, you're new to running. So we know that there are other risk factors that are probably bigger so why don't we focus on the big wins or the big pebbles or whatever, and and then let's find a shoe that that we think um, suits some of your foot, you know, architecture characteristics, um, and then we'll monitor. And it's highly likely that 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 shoe recommendation may change over time, should change over time as you evolve uh, as a runner. Um, if someone comes in with a sore tibialis posterior, then a stability shoe, as if we define it as something with a slightly stiffer medial midsole. Uh, 
it's reasonable to assume that might offload a sorted post by its generation of external supination moment. So it, again, it's not a life sentence. It's not saying you need a stability shoe. It's like, why your tip post sore? Throw on a stability shoe for, for, a, for a few weeks or a few months and then see how you go. So, you know, they have a role, but I, I just wish I had a, a, a better answer. But, you know, whether someone's in pain or not, um, whether, you know, whether the categories continue to exist or not, we're really in a position where we still don't have all the answers and we've got to make decisions based on just good clinical reasoning and, and we still might be wrong. Mm. That's yeah. a good answer. I like it. I, I did want to go back and kind of just repeat what you said because I think it's really good and it's definitely how I, I treat as well. I know a lot of students listen to this and it's something that I talk about a lot with the students at the uni is, you know, when you're talking about footwear with patients rather than probably prescribing too much off their foot type and their biomechanics, but more using tissue stress theory and thinking what characteristics of a shoe are going to best suit your foot type. And I love that idea of using the scale. So someone with like a tip post might on that scale might need something a little bit more stable, whereas someone with a bunion deformity might need you know, a little bit more of a wider forefoot. So rather shoe characteristics and matching that up with what they need rather than just stability cushion and neutral. Yeah. Definitely yeah. agree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was good. And I that study that you mentioned as well, I actually based my um, with um, Dr. Benjamin Peterson. I he was my honors supervisor, and I based um, some research off that study. And then recently, that Cochrane review came out to say that shoes aren't a risk factor for running related injuries. Though it's yeah, it's all over the place, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's just not black and white. Um, we'd love it to be, of course. We'd love it to be. The runners would love it to be, uh, <laughs> but you know. Just because we want it to be, it doesn't mean it is. Yeah. Now, one of the most common questions we got, and I I put this question in here as well, and we also got it from a lot of listeners. A lot of people want to know, what is the, the most common pathology you see clinically and how do you tend to manage it? And is it heel pain? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not heel pain. That said, if you said to me, what's the most common foot pathology I see? It's, yeah. It is absolutely that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the most common pathology I see uh, on a daily basis is uh, patellofemoral pain, but by, by really? quite some way. Yeah, wow. absolutely. I was not expecting um, that. Yeah, I mean, probably a couple of reasons for it. Some of it may be uh, environmental and contextual, and I'm sure it is, but I have worked very closely for a number of years with Dr. Brad Neal, Dr. Simon Lack, both physios, but both did their PhDs in patellofemoral pain. Mm -hmm. And um, as I'm sure Kelly will know, um, when you look at the consensus statements from the patellofemoral pain retreats, when you look at the best practice guide that was published in the BJSM, and when you look at just a recent paper that was published like four days ago, um, foot orthoses come out incredibly favorably for patellofemoral pain, way, way more favorably than I think most people, including podiatrists, appreciate. Mm. Um, so when I work with, you know, two really, you know, really, really good physios, both with, you know, PhDs in patellofemoral pain, um, it's it's no surprise that they uh, they include me and refer me um, and get me early you know get me involved in these cases very very early. So I see a lot of a lot of patellofemoral pain, um, and it may well be because of the. Sorry, Are you giving Kelly. them custom foot orthoses or off the shelf? Uh, normally it's off the shelf, um, because all of the data you know I should go back and you're you're quite right to call me on that. I should go back and say all of the research points really, really favorably to orthoses use, but all of the research done has been done with, with prefabs or off the, mm. or, you know, off the shelf devices. Um, so yeah, we tend to, we tend to just um, give off the shelf, you know, we don't tend to need to go custom and they're not normally something that, are, well, not necessarily something that are going to be used for a long time anyway. You know, mm. we always say to the people like these orthoses are going to be here for, here for a good time, not for a long time. So um <laughs> Yeah, you know, off off the shelf is fine. So yeah, patellofemoral pain, and, and we tend to treat it very much in keeping with the best practice guides and the clinical guidelines. Um, I don't know if you've seen uh, Brad's paper. It was in JOSPT. It was, I think it was published like three days ago. And I haven't quite, even though I've read it because it's so new, I haven't quite committed the uh, title to memory. I think it's called Six Treatments. Oh, I don't oh, know. Is that the one that's like um, cupping, dry needling, stretching yeah <laughs> well you, you we, we joke about this right but you will be surprised to see it's called six treatments have positive effects at three months for people with patellofemoral pain systematic review with meta-analysis and two of the the two physios i mentioned my friends and colleagues they're both authors on it along with a couple of other people at the university at the university we'll, we'll put a link in that to the show notes for people yeah awesome. and uh, oh. 
and you'll be surprised i think what might interest people is um because i know it, it can be uh i don't have a dog in this fight particularly but manual therapy is mentioned mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll just i won't say anything more but i'll just let you read the paper and say this is really really well done science mm. um so that's worth a read uh so yeah we treat patellofemoral pain very much in keeping with all of those guidelines um, and and plantar heel pain which is you know joking aside the, the most common foot problem i see and probably is you as well i'm sure yeah, yeah. um and probably is for most of us worldwide um we treat that pretty much in keeping with the best practice guide as well which um i was lucky enough to be a member of the team that we we published that in the bjsm was it two years ago um so there's a fairly there's a fairly well structured sort of and it's not to say that everyone that comes in for telephone uh, with a plantar heel pain should be treated in the same way it's not a recipe book but it's just it was a systematic review which was then synthesized alongside uh interviews with world leading experts on how they treat it and also the patient's voice as well so like a three-pronged evidence-based tool where we said what does the research tell us about what what works what do the experts tell us about what they think works and what do the patients tell us about what's important to them valuable to them what they think works what they think don't. and then we tried to pull all this together and work out um what the best thing to do was and again orthoses came out reasonably favorably um more so than i thought if i'm honest i, I genuinely it's you know, custom I know you go, or off the shelf it was custom actually and yeah. i go in I, I go into all research with a bit of an open mind as we all should but we all bring our biases we can't you know switch off the fact we're human and i must confess i just didn't think orthoses were going to be were going to come out as strongly as they did i was i was quite surprised um and shockwave um which mm. i know we use but i don't know how it's used in, in in australia but in the uk it's not uncommon for people to say okay i've got heel pain i'm going to go and see the physio for a bit i'm going to try some insoles um i'm going to you know do that for three months six months and at some point down the line okay i'm not getting better let's refer for shockwave that's certainly the way it's traditionally used in the uk it's, now it's um, over here more like chronic when it's not improving yeah, yeah. well what our, what the what, what the guide showed was that actually there's there's reasonable evidence that shockwave should be brought in much much earlier in the treatment pathway. So um, yeah, it, it, we we tend to treat in keeping with um, the best practice guide, which was education, uh, and let's not ever dismiss how important that is. Um, education not just on what 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 the issue is and reassurance, but education on load management and and things. Uh, education um, taping came up really favourably. Orthoses um shockwave and again the thing that we you know i'm sure you know this you know you public you, you spend many years doing research it's, it's a thankless task you're working all day then you're sitting in front of your computer at night no one's getting paid for doing research if anything it costs you time mm. money energy you know you, you go through peer review that's a long drawn out process it finally makes it through peer review you go, oh, thank goodness out it gets there into social media and then someone on Twitter says, this is bullshit. And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. and, you and, can't, uh, you know, can't avoid it. It is what it is. But we had a lot of pushback uh, saying, why wasn't strength Why wasn't strength mentioned? Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is, um, you know, it it's not particularly well uh, um, sort of uh, referred to in the literature yet. I'm sure that will change. And Henrik Reel is doing a lot of work in that regard. But, it, there's, you know, we've got the Rathliff paper. Yeah, that's, but, right. that's the only one, isn't it? That wasn't, but, but that wasn't included in our systematic review because it wasn't of high enough quality. So, you know, there really isn't as much evidence for it. And, you know, you, when you and Ellie had a little, um, you and um, Kelly had a little argument earlier, um, not argument, but, you know, just had a set to where she said, you know, strength load management, we, we hang our hats on it, but we don't know that it's as magical as we sometimes say. It's the same for plantar heel pain. You know, I'm not saying we don't do it, but the evidence isn't really supportive of it yet. Mm. Uh, when we spoke to um, patients, they didn't see it as particularly helpful or valuable. Um, so, you know, we really could only make conclusions based on the data that emerged. And strength training just, you know, we made we, we referred it to it in the discussion. We were just like, look, you know, and we had physios in particular just going, this is this is ridiculous. Like, massive mm -hmm. piece of work and you've left out strength training. It's like, we haven't left it out. It just, it isn't there yet. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. <laughs> so um, maybe it will be, maybe, you know, in a few years, someone can redo the, the, the systematic review and maybe we'll have more work. But um, yeah, I'm not saying we don't include it, but I'm saying it, it's, it's not in the best practice guide um, because the science isn't really there to support it.
Yeah, it's interesting though. Like, and I'm sure. I mean, seeing plantar heel pain compared to say an Achilles or a tibia or a perineal, even giving it strength training in isolation, it typically doesn't respond like tendons and muscles do anyway. So it doesn't seem to be. And again, as you said, the research may change, but it doesn't seem to be the the low hanging fruit to add in. Like, it's not what people are missing. It's more the cuddling and the offloading. It tends to to do a lot better with earlier on anyway, not to say it doesn't need strength training later on, but earlier on, it seems to be more the, the cuddling stuff. I think it depends on what the patient is wanting. Like if the mm-hmm. patient's wanting it, like is that study based off pain or is it based off function? Because if they're wanting to return to some sort of functional activity, I think that's going to involve some sort of graded return to activity, which kind of may involve a version of strength training whereas if it's purely for pain then yeah I don't think that strength training is the answer to making it less painful Mm. yeah and let's and let's be clear like if someone comes in and they're a runner and and they've got uh, you know plantar heel pain it doesn't matter what they've got if they come in and they're a runner what you do to to reduce their sensitivity um maybe one thing but let's be honest when you get them to end stage rehab you're a runner you know you should be doing strength work anyway let's be honest yeah. even if not even you know we we know you know that that will benefit you as a human as a runner mm. as someone in their 40s with sarcopenia setting in like the reality is just do it um mm. but yeah you're absolutely right it doesn't mean it's 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 the the, the golden goose for, for pain management that said i do see quite quite a few people that when they start doing it just just knowing that you know moving reducing mm-hmm. some of that you know reducing some of that hypervigilance you know making them feel more robust improving their self efficacy you know all of those things that we know exercise brings to the table they're never bad things but if they do it and then they suddenly get a flare up in their pain then it can actually negatively feed into the fact that they feel fragile and broken and yeah. that something's da- something's damaged so as you as you guys know you know very well anyway um you just got to tread that tightrope a little bit does was that the review did shockwave did you did it recommend shockwave at six to eight weeks post non-responding to any treatment was that a different review what was the when did it recommend to shockwave to be brought in uh pretty early actually and uh it's one of those things where it's just, it was such a big part of our lives for so long and then once yeah. it gets published it's like you just could put it to the back of your head so I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head uh it's open it's open it's bjsm open access yeah um, yeah i'm just thinking it's, i, I it's, do remember it, reading it it's earlier than earlier than i think most people think and earlier than i think most people when you speak to them are actually doing do you use it earlier on do you find with your patients we do tend to bring it in a bit earlier now that we did yeah. for sure yeah. um i'm not saying day one um you know day one someone comes in they're still getting taped they're still getting you know educated to within an inch of their life um we're still trying to draw out from them what what is important and meaningful to them um mm-hmm. and then trying to sort of mold what our management looks like around their values um so you know if they've had a you know if they've heard about it if they're worried about it if a friend of theirs had it and said it was agony um then we can't disregard that th- 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 those beliefs and th- that, those values but yeah we generally on the whole all other things being equal tend to bring it in earlier now than we did say mm. four or five years ago yeah what um what what way do you think foot orthoses work and how <laughs> we're going straight them? there are we <laughs> straight there straight. And how do you use them clinically <laughs> And if you can just answer it really simply in one sentence, that'd be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Why not? It is, it is that simple, isn't it? Um, yeah, straight into the big one. I was asked this in a job interview once. Um, really? I'll never forget. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're in a job interview and you want to give short snappy answers. You want to try and show what you know. And, and out comes a question. You're like, this is like a, a PhD. Like, <laughs> this, <laughs> how much yeah, time this have you got? This, this isn't an interview question. Uh, how do we think they work? What is their mechanism of effect? Mm-hmm. Um, here's the thing. Like, we don't know. Let's be honest. Like, we, we just do not know for sure. I think that's the first thing to say. By what by what potential mechanisms may they be working? Um, potentially mechanical, i.e. modification, manipulation of... Uh, kinematics kinetics mm-hmm. to bunch those under the direct mechanical effects so manipulation of you know mechanical metrics uh, new, the neuromotor effect so you put something under the foot you know we talk about putting something under the foot and having a mechanical effect well the foot isn't just a triangle attached to the end of the leg it's you know it doesn't just it's not just a slave to mechanical laws it's attached to a human with a with a central nervous system so that sometimes throws up funny things so you look at 
work that showed feet pronated more on anti pronation devices. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't matter how smart. Doesn't matter how smart you are. There's no biomechanical explanation for that. That's a neuromotor effect. So yeah, mechanical number one. Number two, neuromotor. Number three, psychological. Um, and I don't just mean placebo. I mean con contextual effects. And again, this is my current area of interest. My current area of of personal research. And we don't have we don't have any answers here yet. But I just don't think we can disregard the fact that any intervention isn't having some kind of influence psychologically as well. Um, you know, when we look at other interventions that are similar to orthoses in, in so much that they're, they're debated a lot and they're, they're considered passive and they have an, uh, you know, um, I guess an, an equivocal evidence base. We look at things like acupuncture, kinesio tape, therapeutic ultrasound, three things that, you know, you say in a room of physios and you can just see the room just divide immediately. Um, <laughs> You know, when you look at research that's been done into those, there's, there's been shown to be huge influences on beliefs, expectations, the the, the language used at time of delivery. Um, I just don't see how orthoses can't be privy to that as well. Um, and then fourth possibility is some other mechanism by which we have not yet identified. Let's never, let's never assume, you know, mechanical, neuromotor, psychological, feel like the big three. Uh, and then there's some other. Um, and the crazy thing is, of course, for each individual, we don't know which one or two or all three of those interplaying may be manipulated and may be resulting in the outcome we see, whether that outcome be good or bad. And we know that outcomes can be both. So I used to, I went, I went hard in the paint on, on the kinetic manipulation of kinetic metrics, not so long ago, yeah, up till recently, in that we know changing alignment, repositioning the skeleton, you know, the before and after image, you know, you know, you, the kinematic effects we know that they are person specific unpredictable um sometimes unexpected and sometimes unexplainable and it, they don't seem to be what need to happen for symptoms to change either you know i think we we will agree that that's the case so then we look at kinetic changes and go okay well they're still a bit person specific and unpredictable but it makes sense that these devices might be working by reducing load on a structure you know reducing tensile load compressive load rather than changing position. So I, I definitely went hard in the paint on these things are manipulating kinetic metrics. Um, so I, I would for many years refer to them as, as load modifiers. So if people said to me, oh, I've got I've got an arch support. No, it's not an arch support. It, you know, it's, it's a load. Yeah. yeah, it's a load, it's a load modifier. Um, more recently, and I'm not saying I probably still that's probably still the way I describe them to patients. I like, think of this as because I think if you if you tell someone they're in a bad posture and this is going to improve their posture, You've completely set them up to think they need this forever. Um, whereas if you tell them, look, we, this is a load modifier. And if we get the design of it right, we can reduce the load on the, saw, you, the bit of you that's sore. And then when it's less sore and we've built up its own capacity and tolerance, we can take this guy away and you can you know, live life happily ever after. So I, I would probably still use that description with patients. But it does feel like it as calling them a load modifier. I've just said, you know, mechanical, neuromotor, psychological, or something I don't yet understand. Well, load modifier only really covers one of those four, right? And so I'm, I feel like I'm I'm already over committing to saying I know that I understand these things better than I am. So although I might describe that to my patients, I I don't know that I'm super comfortable referring to them as load modifiers in a room of colleagues or in a conference anymore. Um, I don't know. I've got nothing better to call them, by the way, because even if we call them symptom modifier, you know, we're getting into the realms here of just having such a wide umbrella that just says, oh, this is a symptom modifier. It doesn't tell us anything about the mechanism. Yeah. Um, so I guess what I'm what I'm trying to say, waffling on to your answer is, I don't know how they work. I know they work for some of the people some of the time. I know they don't work for all of the people all of the time. I know that even after prescribing them for 21 years now, I still have poor outcomes with them. You know, I like to think that my I have fewer poor outcomes now than I did, but I, I never go into this with patients. I never oversell what I think is going to happen with patients. I always say, look, like I could have 10, you know, I'm going to hear pharmacy analogy incoming. I could have 10 people in front of me with a headache and I give them all the same exact same dose of the exact same drug. I don't get 10 identical responses. And it's exactly the same with these devices. Um so, I mean, I know I've probably, you've probably heard my, my, my drug analogy for orthoses before, Blake, if you've, um, I, I if use you've... it every, I use it every day. Every <laughs> it's not, per day. it's not perfect, but it gets across, I think what you're, what we're trying to say, which is, you know, like we say, antibiotics are for a week, 
um and you know antibiotics are short term mm -hmm. but aspirin after a stroke is long term you know some orthoses are short term some might be long term um you know here's a drug and we give it to you at too low a dose and it doesn't do anything uh, we give it to too high a dose and there are there are un unnecessary inappropriate side effects we've got to get that therapeutic window that dose just right here's an orthosis if we give it to you and you say it's it's comfy but it's not helping maybe we just it's too low a dose we'll 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 dial up the dose if we give it to you and it makes something else hurt you know it's too high a dose we'll titrate accordingly um I, i'm just open honest transparent um with patients and say look like I, I don't prescribe these things very often way way more infrequently than people assume but when i do i'm pretty honest about like this is why I'm giving it to you. I wouldn't give, I wouldn't recommend it if I didn't think it would help, but I need you to know that it's still, even though I think it might help, it still might not help, yeah. um, which is a tough sell sometimes because we're scientists. We're happy with that gray. We're happy with being uncertain or at least we should be, but we can't assume or expect our patients or our athletes to be as happy with uncertainty as, as we are. Especially when they're in pain as well. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. do you still use? Like, your i guess umbrella concept thinking about orthosis prescription i mean do you use much of you know the neutral calcaneal resting position versus the pronated and, and bringing them back or is it more you know tissue stress theory where someone has a perineal issue so you're going to wedge them laterally rather than looking what their rear foot's doing and trying to put them back to neutral how, how do you find kind of that um those concepts and how do you use both of them or if you use both of them clinically yeah i think i've probably uh, subscribe more to the latter so you know if, I, if i'm giving this thing to make something that's sore less sore um mm -hmm. you know if you if you um you know if you basically know if you identify what tissue saw uh, and you identify what job it has um what sort of internal job it's trying to, to to do and then you provide that job externally then all other things being equal you should hopefully offload it so generally speaking a, val a val valgus posting should offload the perineae various posting should offload tip post fhl yeah you know heel raises should offload uh achilles um we know it doesn't always work like that but generally speaking it's it's that's probably more where my thought processes are rather than looking at foot posture and what yeah. i generally tend to do is decide okay what what do i think i need to deliver externally to you know I always think about what i want to achieve and work backwards so you know what do i want to achieve okay i want to offload the target tissue how do I think I need, you know, what do I, what forces do I need to apply to the foot to offload the target tissue? Okay, going back one more step, what do I need this device to look like to apply those forces? Going back one more step from there, how do I cast this foot? You know, now I know what I think the device needs to look like. How do I cast the foot to make the device look like that? Because ultimately the way you cast the foot dictates the shape of the device. So rather than kind of looking at the foot, casting it, and then deciding what prescription to write, I, you know, just work backwards. What do I want to achieve? How do I, what forces do I need to apply to achieve it? What does this thing need? To, what shape does it need to be or design does it need to be to apply those forces? Go back one step. H how do I achieve that shape? And, and at this point, if we know there's a prefab, if we've got a good understanding of the prefab, um, sort of a prefab uh, range available, you may get to a certain point where you go, what do I think this device needs to look like? Oh, actually, I know a prefab that looks almost almost identical to that. Great, uh, you know, discussion over. Prefab goes in because yeah. your foot, your your target tissue does not care whether it's custom or prefab. Does not know nor care how much it costs if it's the right design to deliver what we think needs to be delivered to have a therapeutic effect. Then you know, that's why I always say to people, say, "What prefab do you use?" I, like, I suggest that people just want to have a favorite and stock it in the clinic like have a really good understanding of the prefab market how it varies the ones that have got various posts the ones that are high in the midfoot the ones that are pitched sat in the sagittal plane and then basically at some point go oh this would be do this would do well with x or y or z like just the same way that when you take a mold for a custom device you don't always write the same prescription you write the prescription based on what you think you need you need but well, why would you only give one prefab um so yeah i tend to work backwards probably applying what would be traditionally referred to as, as more of a tissue stress approach yeah i like it that's good mm. yeah do you talking on the the topic of kind of bunions toe deformity and foot posture do you think that these things are caused by shoes and what do you think are, is the role of kind of minimalist shoes in the general population and to pre-frame this this is a very polarizing question as you can see on social media and as a podiatrist i feel like we get it 
quite a lot. And I do think that there's there's information from both worlds that are beneficial for us and for patients. But yeah, what do you think about the whole, you know, minimalist shoes and being barefoot and shoes causing foot pain and bunions and things like that? Yeah, it is polarizing. Um, and like anything, there's a, a you know, if, like any polar, like any debate, there's, there's, there's a false dichotomy, i.e. there's people, you know, camping out at each extreme of this polarized debate the people that say shoes are evil and you know nike nike is the devil you should only be in you know barefoot shoes um and then at the other extreme saying this is absolutely ridiculous you know and, and the reality is i don't know that the truth is ever going to be at these extremes uh, and i think it is a false dichotomy um i don't think it's unreasonable to to adopt philosophies that say that shoes apply external forces to feet um if we if we just go back to you know just take all of the kind of uh instagram debates out of it and we just go back to high school physics if you apply a force to a structure um there will be consequences now what those consequences are uh, you know will depend on the magnitude of the force the location of the force application and the the time of delivery so you know this is this is why you see a rock that's had water dripping on it for four years and over time like just water has put a dent in granite like you know look, continuous force on structures <laughs> probably changes structures right so i don't think it's unreasonable and this is it you you look at people saying shoes are evil you need to be more barefoot some of the stuff they say is completely reasonable they've just gone a bit too far they've just kind of bit a bit too extreme and they're normally selling you know when someone's that extreme and promises to have all the answers we always say follow the money yeah <laughs> there's, a, there's a 12 week course on the end of that Correct. There's something, right? There's a 12 week course or there's a shoe or both. But, you know, if someone's got a really strong opinion, they seem to have all the answers on a topic that doesn't feel that we should have all the answers, follow the money. Mm. Um, but that said, as a father of two boys who are now seven and nine, um, for the first couple of years of their life, I kept them as barefoot as I could. Um, when they first, you know, started going to school and they were in shoes, they were in Nike Freeze, a shoe that was very flexible, very flat, very wide. Uh, I still keep them in shoes that are, you know, because seven and nine, they don't have adult, you know, their foot is not fully, um, they don't have a full skeleton yet. You know, it's still, a uh, vast portion of it is still cartilaginous. So they're like little bags of jelly, these feet. So they are more prone to um, external force application being problematic. Um, mm. So, you know, I can't sort of sit here and say the barefoot the barefoot tribe speak nonsense when they don't generally and mm. when these things I've applied these principles to my own children that said we know there are people that have lived barefoot their entire lives Maasai tribes in Kenya women who are in their 30s who've never had a shoe on their foot in 30 years who have hallux valgus deformities <laughs> like we know this like this is this is this is this is known so we can't just say that bunions are caused by shoes, you know, bunions. And I'm no, this is not my wheelhouse. I'm no expert, but a very good friend of mine and who is my mentor, uh, Dr. Simon Spooner did his PhD in, um, in HAV and the predilection for HAV. And every time you talk to him about this and every time he posts on it, um, he gives you an equation, which is, uh, and if I remember it's P equals G plus E plus G times E where P is your phenotype g is your genotype and e is your environment so your phenotype is your the physical expression of your genetic code your genotype is your genetic code and e you know your environment is you where you live you know environment around your foot as well um what we're talking about here is um it's called gene environment interaction it's a whole branch of epigenetics um, and if you look at g if you look at gene environment interaction you know and again i'm not smart enough wikipedia will, will probably do a better job of explaining it to you than i am but essentially it says you know if you give the same thing to, to different people, they don't all end up the same. You know, <laughs> it's just not the way life works. So I think when you look at someone who says, I wore shoes and it gave me hammer toes, I wore shoes, it gave me bunions. Those are very real, very valid experiences that we should not illegitimize. But let's not pretend that everyone that wears the same shoe is going to get hammer toes or bunions. It's, it's, it's the answer is probably some somewhere within the complexity of gene environment interaction. Um, Minimal issues, I think your second part of the question was what role do minimal issues in our life? In children's lives, I think they, they should be priority. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've said I love to run in, in what would be considered the opposite of a minimal issue. But then um, 
today when we went to fireworks evening uh, just earlier, I was wearing a pair of Converse. I, arguably not minimalist, but very flat, not particularly oh, cushioned. How can you um, wear that? Your body just must be bone on bone. Where is I it? know, I know, absolutely. So, you know, I think I think variation is a good thing. You know, we know this variation in training, mm. uh, you know, variation in footwear so yeah i run i don't run in anything that would be close to being defined as a minimalist shoe but i look at some of the shoes i wear a lot of the time converse uh, i wear a pair of like oxfords or brogues at work very hard very flat um yeah. too, too pointy for some people on instagram i know but you know no bunions yet and such wood and then in the summer i'm in flip-flops uh, or thongs as you call them um three months four months if we're lucky we don't get great summers here as you know but yeah i mean I think variation is key. I don't believe um, we should demonise any extreme, really. Yeah. Uh, just picking your brain a little bit further, Ian, on um, like more minimalist shoes for for kids. Is that something that you typically recommend to to patients that you see? And like, to the best of your knowledge, is there any literature supporting that? Uh, it, to uh, children. So I'm I'm um, out of the the pediatric podo pediatric game now. Um, I always defer, I'll be honest, even queries about my own children, I get straight on the phone to Kylie Williams, who she's my guru, um, and she's most of our gurus, I know. So um, I don't see children in clinic. Um, it is something that sometimes, the way I, I treated my own kid, treated, um, it's the way I, I, you know, the strategy I adopted for footwear with my own children. If I'm talking to friends and we're at a barbecue or something and they, they want to have a chat about it, I'll I'll preface it by saying, look, I, I see adults now. I, I And kids aren't mini adults, uh, you know, so I'm not I'm a bit out of date with the literature, I have to say. Um, but generally speaking, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. I'm sure if I am someone who's listening, maybe even Kylie herself will will call me on it quite rightly. But I think a shoe that's wide, a shoe that's flexible. Um, is, is probably the play and anytime they can be not not in shoes when it's safe to not be in shoes environmentally that's that's got to be good as well because we want them feeling kitchen tiles we want them feeling grass and sand we want in you know we, we we need we need load for bones to develop that's why they have treadmills in space for the astronauts and they still come back osteoporotic um we want those intrinsic muscles i do remember working in a pediatric clinic uh 2000 five ish 2006 i'm going back a bit and and someone will and, and most of my experience and do, do you guys work with peds still yeah yeah i work i work quite a bit the last couple of years i work quite a bit with, with peds yeah i don't know if it's the same still um but certainly my experience in in in, in a pediatric clinic within the national health service here in the uk in 2005 2006 was that 80 percent of my day um was reassuring worried parents. I'm yes. not saying that's a bad yeah. thing, by the way. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It was, it was. I'm quite, quite happy to do it. Um, but you know, I remember one person coming in with, with their child who was uh, like ten months, uh, hadn't started walking yet, and they were worried about their fifth toe being a bit curly. Um, but they hadn't started walking yet. So you think about, you know, I said, look, well, you think about the things that often, you know, promote good toe alignment. And it's the skeleton, which probably, you know, this is a bag of jelly, this foot. And it's the intrinsic muscles. Well, they're not working yet because they haven't taken in their first step. So, you know, and it, you just sort of think to yourself, yeah, like getting down on your feet, loading your feet, experiencing what different materials, you know, and sensations feel like under your feet. It's such a sensory, um, uh, not organ, that's not the right word, but you know what I mean? I mean, I think being barefoot as much as possible when it's safe to be. And then when you are in shoes, being they need to be you know as flexible and wide as possible yeah. um but just that you know say kids aren't mini adults adults aren't big kids so i don't know you know you look at some instagram accounts that say that that's the way adults should be mm. i think what's true of kids doesn't necessarily have to apply to adults um mm. yeah, yeah. Answer. i was surprised to hear that you didn't say that your two boys you haven't got them a pair of vapor flies yet and they're not wearing them to school. <laughs> <laughs> but they're cross country it's funny one my youngest who's seven is super quick for, for his age yeah. um he's the you know absolutely the fastest in his class at sports day but but by by some distance he's just crazy quick uh don't know where he don't know where he gets it from it's certainly not me um but uh, you know every now and then he says let's have a race let's have a race and, and i'm not the dad that lets my kids win that's not the yeah, way i roll you um they, you know i know that i know the time will come where they'll beat me at everything so i'm just going to hang on to these victories that i have for as long <laughs> as i can and i also want him to know that when he does beat me like you've really beaten me today, you know. Yeah, like, so yeah. Every if we're ever you know out going for a walk on Sunday, you know, while the while the roast dinner's in the oven, 
do you have a race daddy yeah let's do this and i will i will smoke him without fail <laughs> like, uh, and i and i am not embarrassed to do it and my wife's like at least make it a bit i was like no no like i need to go balls out here to see how much I beat him by. And then over the years, the, how much I beat him by is going to get smaller, smaller, smaller. Now, I'm not saying I'm wearing vapor fires for these little races with my kid, but there'll come a time where I'm probably going to have to reach for them. <laughs> yeah, you, you, and, you um, just kind of hope that over time, like shoe technology just slowly gets better and better as he gets quicker. So you've always got that yeah. bit of buffer zone. So it's like... Yeah, I, I don't think I've got too long left. And this is him run, literally running in, in Converse. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm worried for I'm worried for the future, and I'm worried when he decides that he wants when at some point his feet get as big as mine, and he goes into my study and he looks at a wall of shoes and he's like, oh, you know, I remember using my dad's aftershave or you know wearing your dad's you know borrowing your dad's stuff when you got old enough, and he's got a whole load of shoes that he's got access to, so it's going to be a fun time. That's good. All right, well, we'll for this question because we don't want to keep you too late. We. Um, what I did want to ask a, a couple of questions that are really important, I think, because we know a, definitely a lot of podiatrists who listen to this podcast. And, and as a podiatrist myself, and you know, someone like yourself having so much experience, you know, where do you think we need improvement? And for you know, students and younger grads listening, how can they become proficient? Or I guess how can they become a, a really good, well rounded clinician? And where can they go and where can they look? Yeah, good question. Um, Again, apologies in advance for this potentially being a really UK biased answer. So, um, you know, it's the only sort of lens I can view this through. But because you guys may well be doing this stuff already, but I look at um, a lot of new grads here and people with only you know a couple of years experience, and it seems to be that their focus is on um, how do I how do I get better at treating X or treating Y, or you know how do I get better at treating heel pain because I see a lot of heel pain or you know, how do I get better at treating footballers? Because, you know, football boots are a challenge to work with when you're not experienced with them. And what I don't see much of is people saying, how do I, how do I be a better communicator? Like, mm -hmm. How do I be, how yeah. do I get better? How do I get better interacting with other humans? And I, and I truly believe time spent on communication skills, you know, motiv motivational interviewing or health coaching or, you know, uh, you know, those, 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 those soft skills really where that we're going to use with every patient every day from the minute they walk in the door, you know, we talk about how, what does a good history look like? And most students will be like, Oh, what, have you got a pro form of the questions you ask? But what they're not saying is, you know, what they're not looking at a history taking as is like, how much should we be listening versus talking? And we all know we talk more than we, we should. And we don't listen as, 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 as long as we should. Um, how do we really tease out, you know, the, the the patient's values and what's meaningful to them? That should be front and center of, of of every consultation. And I don't think it always is. You know, people come in with, and you first thing you say to them is, okay, tell me what hurts, rather than say, tell me your story. They're two really different questions that open up completely different discussions. And we also project our own beliefs on patients. Where tell me what hurts? Well, my knee hurts. Okay, they're, what a good outcome for them looks like is their knee not hurting, but that may not be the case. You know, a better question being, tell me what perfect looks like to you, you know, yeah. and that may be something completely different. Um, so I think, you know, better understanding of people, psychology, within that better understanding of pain science. I know I'm preaching to converted here because, you know, I've listened to you guys talk about this at length. Um, and probably the one thing I see young clinicians not being comfortable with is doing nothing. Mm. Um so what I mean by that is they always feel they have to tangibly do something for the patient. You know, I've had consultations where patients have come in and we've fairly quickly drew, drawn out from them what, what's really important to them, what they want to achieve. And perhaps all they've come in with is the huge concern that they have a stress fracture. And, and the, the main thing they've brought with them is I want, I'm, I have, I'm worried I have a stress fracture and I've got a race coming up. And, it may well be that all you need to do is spend time, you know, listening to them, you know, assessing them, taking history. And then at the end of the consultation saying, I'm reasonably confident you do not have a stress fracture. You don't have night pain. You know, you don't have pain on percussion. Uh, your single leg hop is pain free. And they say, can I run this this weekend? I've got, you know, a 10K race. I've been training for it. Can I run? And you're like, yeah, I give you, you know, you, you, I, I, I reassure you, you don't have a stress fracture and they leave. You haven't done anything or have you? You've talked to them, you've listened to them, you've provided reassurance. But I know so many people that would feel like I need to do something like mm -hmm. what do I need to do? And all of a sudden the patient comes in, I'm worried I've got a stress fracture. You know, the classic, they come in with one problem, they leave with five problems. You know, they come in with 
I think I've got a stress fracture. They leave with a leg length difference, a rear foot varus, you know, all of this terminology that sounds yeah. terrifying. I think, yeah. I think young people just need to be good, you know, really, really focused on understanding humans, understand human behavior, get good at communication, understand pain science. Um, and, you know, a couple of hours or a couple of days, some time and some energy investing in those skills rather than investing in a laser machine or yeah. <laughs> to use the, but one thing that's super popular in the UK at the moment, it would just make you such a better clinician. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Beautiful. All right, last last question. And I was just looking at our list of questions, which are around HIV and, and patients, which you've definitely, I'm going to have to steal far out. Half of my consults these days are going to be analogies I've stolen from you, um, like the deep <laughs> moment interaction. So some of the questions you've definitely <laughs> answered and we'll pre-frame that at the start. But what I wanted to, and I definitely know this is a, a hot topic for podiatrists, but what do you believe when we talk about foot type and biomechanics, what do you believe and say when people talk about them being the cause of an injury in the sense of one foot rolls in more than the other, or this is why you've got the injury, or you've got this limb length difference. This is why you've got this injury. Cause we know there's a lot more nuance to it than that. But uh, yeah. How would you frame that for a lot of podiatrists listening who, um, who think that way or, or talk and discuss with their patients that way? Yeah. It's, it's tricky, isn't it? Because we, we immediately, we immediately assume we understand risk factors for injury better than we do. If someone comes in with pain and you identify that this is what's caused it, there's so many potential flaws in that thinking. But even if we go back a step, we, we, we have to be in a position where we, we, sh, we, sh, we have good, robust evidence that says these things are risk factors for injury, biomechanical risk factors. And I don't know that we do. Uh, in fact, well, I do know that we don't, I should say. <laughs> so, you know, when we look, when we look at sort of... Um, what things are are not reliably, but what things do we think are, are greater risk factors for injury? When we look at the things that most of the totality of the evidence tends to point towards, it's things like body mass index, previous injury. I, you know, I think you know there's a, there's a systematic review done on running injury risk factors almost every year now, mm -hmm. and the same stuff kind of gets found out. You know, BMI, uh, previous. Um, previous injury not just running injury previous injury of any kind but then when you look at the biomechanical risk factors it all gets a bit oh I don't know. you know you're like um yeah. it's, it's a bit more hazy so i don't know that we have robust science to, to build opinions on in the first place that's the first thing to say the next thing is if someone comes in we would say if someone comes in in pain uh, with a pronated foot it doesn't mean they're in pain because of the pronated foot like what what you're seeing is someone who's already in pain and the way they're built you know, the physical, yeah, their, their, their phenotype, the physical expression of their genetic code. So, you know, someone comes in and they say, I'm in pain. It's factually accurate, correct statement. You say to them, you have pronated feet, also factually accurate. But again, like that now suddenly linking those two, the like, whoa, can we jump straight there? You know, is it is it appropriate to do that? If I walk in and I say, look, my knee hurts. Someone says, you have, you have anterior knee pain. Yes, I do. You are a bald man. Yes, I am like both factually correct statements about me, what, what madness it would be to link those two, right? What you're doing is you're taking one of my, phys one of my, one of my uh, physical characteristics and you're linking it to the pain I've come into your clinic with. Like, I feel like someone comes in and you say, oh, you know, this hurts. Oh, it's because of your leg length. Might be right, but are we just linking two things that coexist in one human? Um, I, I get really, really wary of people that say we're going to get to the root cause of the problem that's the, that's the buzzword isn't it like yeah. come and see me in my come and see me in my clinic because i've got this bit of kit and we're going to get to the root cause of the problem and you're like oh are we <laughs> you know um in runners the root cause of the problem might be that they trained a bit like a dickhead like, yeah. like you know uh, i don't need a bit of fancy kit like let's just have a look at your strava let's listen to you you talk for 10 minutes and be like i think i see what's happened here so yeah what about my leg length like yeah okay like I'm not too worried about that. The same way I'm not too worried about what lovely hair Blake has and what absent hair I have. Um, <laughs> so at the same time, I'm wary that even as I say this, it, it makes it sound like I don't think that these biomechanical characteristics could ever be associated with pain. And I don't think that's true either. I think what I'm trying to highlight here is just how murky it all is and how quick we are to jump to biomechanical causes. And I, I don't know that I'm comfortable doing that so quickly. Um, mm. You know, and I think this is what you can tease out in the history. If someone comes into me and they say, yeah, let's take the scenario of someone coming in and saying, I, um, I've always, uh, yeah, I've been running for, for 10 years. 
Um, but that said, I've always wanted to do a half marathon, but I've never got there because every single time my weekly volume goes above X or my weekly frequency or intensity goes above Y, uh, I get that media, I get tip post pain every single time. And you've got a 10 year history here of someone having a, you know, I'm doing strength work, I'm sleeping well, I'm, I'm eating well, I'm trying to do all the things that I know are, are, are smart, but I just can't get above this ceiling. Every time I get to a certain point, tip post complaints. And I look at them and, you know, by any definition, they have a pronated foot, you know, foot posture index plus 12, whatever, whatever you want to call it. That's really different to someone coming in and saying, I've been running for 10 years. I clock 50, 60 K a week without fail. I've, you know, touch, I've been super lucky with injury. I've not been injured for nine and a half years. I've been running PBs over every distance. But six months ago, I finally decided to have a crack at the marathon, up my volume, up my frequency, up my intensity. And now I've got tip post pain. I look at their feet and they've got exactly the same foot, pronated foot posture index plus 12. Both of these people have tip post pain. Both have a pronated plus 12 FPI index score. But they're two really different people, aren't they? One of whom has clearly just overloaded tip post with training. And I don't know that it's fair to say their foot posture has anything necessarily to do with that because for nine and a half years, they were golden. The other one who could never get above a certain ceiling, maybe, we still can't be certain, but I'm a bit more confident in perhaps saying, your feet and the way they behave and the way they interact with the environment might be placing this particular tissue under a bit of high demand. Should we see if helping them out allows you to push above that threshold? So again, it depends. It's contextual. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you, you, you blend as always your, your knowledge of the area. You, you accept what you don't know. You blend that with clinical reasoning and experience. And then you apply that to the, to the individual in front of you. Mm. Yeah, good great answer. answer we always say you know our job would be so much easier if we were uh, a clinician who did just say that yes your your pain is because of your leg length discrepancy it just make it'd be so much easier but we we tend to go down that moral track of being yeah. better better and clinicians you, yeah <laughs> i know those bloody ethics they always get in my way as well it's annoying and you, you touched on that before as well like they can come in with one problem and leave with five especially if you're talking about biomechanics because those things you can't change either and if they're leaving going Oh, I've got flat feet, a limb length difference, and a knee valvus. I'm never going to be able to do anything. Yeah, you've 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 sent a runner out back out into the world, more fragile, more hyper vigilant. Um, you've 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 done them a disservice as a as a as a patient, as a fellow human. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely, mate. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll end it there because I know we'll be just keep talking for an hours and hours. Now, for people to to find you and and I guess see the content and things that you're up to what's the the best way to follow you is it do you just want to give people your number on here and they can just call you at any time <laughs> yeah. yeah um yeah i must confess i'm, I'm on a bit of a social media no, not a social media break but i've not been mm. as active on there of late mm. so instagram is probably where i hang the most um yeah. twitter much less so um yeah. just twitter's just got too toxic for me in every in every uh, way and shape and form so yeah instagram i'm at uh what, what, what is my handle sports product info i think yeah yeah uh, instagram is at sports product info uh twitter is at sports underscore pod um but if you put ian griffiths sports podiatrist into google you'll find my website and then off the back of that uh it's facebook and again i don't post on facebook at all anymore i barely go on twitter uh, normally i'm just on twitter having you know, posting gifts um yeah. Instagram, I every now and then do a few things on my stories. I need to get back into the infographics. They've dropped yeah. off. I've just been too busy. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So what are you up to at the moment? You're obviously clinically, but you're doing some research and you're doing some stuff with Monash University. Is that right? Yeah, just I just started actually. Um, so yeah, I'm in clinic two and a half days a week. Yeah. Um, I um, teach, I've got a teaching post for one day a week at Queen Mary University of London. So I teach on the... Um, sports and exercise medicine um master's degree there yeah. so that's that keeps me occupied with you know and oversee got a couple of students that i've just inherited and we're overseeing their msc projects over the next year so we're going to do some cool cool qualitative stuff with regards to foot orthoses because i don't think there's enough of that out there you doing the color for... the color study that was one of the questions oh how was... Well. was it yeah. uh so yeah no not with these students that that will come in time for sure um we uh, Dr. Simon Spooner, who I mentioned earlier, who did his PhD in Hallux Valgus, and he's a really good friend of mine, really good mentor, one of the smartest people I know by a mile. Um, at the start of lockdown 20, 2020, we decided we were 
you know, uh, just do a, a survey of, of what people's beliefs were uh, about the color of their orthoses. Because as we know, we spend so much time caring and thinking about um, what material should the shell be? Should it be polypropylene? Should it be carbon fiber? Should it be EVA? What, sh what shape should it be? So we think about its material. We think about its geometry and its stiffness and i.e. its thickness. We think about our modifications, our heel raises, our forefoot additions. We, you know, and then we just go, oh, whatever top cover the lab have got. Um, and that top cover is the only thing the patient sees, right? It's the only thing they look at when it's down in their shoe. And once again, let's let's not pretend we're not influenced by color. You know, everywhere around us there is color. It, it influences our thoughts, our behaviors, and our cognition. Marketing knows this, and it uses it to its own benefit. Nature knows this. We, you know, road signs. We know when we're being warned of something. We know what what bugs are, are poisonous, or, or you know, um, so. I don't think it's unreasonable. Maybe it is, but here's the here's the thing: we don't know, so let's ask the question, right? But I don't think it's unreasonable to say that the color of these things might be something to consider. It might not, but I think it's worth asking the question. So we did a survey where we asked podiatrists and patients um, a couple of questions. Uh, it was because it was online because it was locked down. So we asked them: we asked podiatrists, do you consider color when you prescribe orthoses? Just good old fashioned yes or no. We asked them. Um, what's the most common color you prescribe? We asked them um, a couple of other kind of color related questions. And we got eight, over 800 podiatrists reply to this oh. survey, which in the world of research is, is a big number, which, um, and then we were going to do, a, um, you know, it's qualitative works. We can do a thematic analysis and see what, what themes emerged. When we asked patients, we said to them, were you offered to choose the color of your own devices? Do you think it's important? Um, and a couple of, what color would you choose? But and then we asked them, if you had to describe your pain as a color, what, what, what color would you describe pain as? And that isn't particularly groundbreaking. There's research that's that's done this before, and it's said that people tend to describe infl inflammatory type problems as unsurprisingly red and orange. Mm -hmm. um, people describe arthritic pain as, as black or gray. Um, and there's a couple of other bits and pieces as well. Um, and people say, well, that's 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 the that's the the ramblings of a hippie. But let's be clear, pain is a complex personal you know multifaceted emergent experience that we ask people to give a number between zero and ten like you, you if you're going to attach a number to it it's an arbitrary number why, why not ask them to attach a color i don't think it's it's that different right it's just that people aren't used to it so it, they're uncomfortable because it's new to them and then we wanted to see if these 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 kind of patient and clinician beliefs married up um and our thought process, and we, we've published a paper on it, but, well, we did and we didn't. So we, we were going to publish a paper on it. And then we when we went to sort of submit it to various journals, they said, does it have ethical approval? Now, again, my understanding was you didn't need ethical approval for a survey that was promote, that was done online, because ethics is about making sure people are safe. And you're not yep. putting them at risk. There were no people involved. There was no interaction. There was no... Um, privacy issues because it was completely anonymous we weren't asking them personal questions we weren't asking them questions about gender or anything that could be considered uncomfortable so i just didn't think ethics applied i was wrong um so we can't get ethics retrospectively so we now have this work yeah. that just can't that no one will no one will publish <laughs> and the, my, my concern now is yeah we could get ethics now and we could run it again but if we run it again we've already primed people yeah, yeah the problem is that that was really raw data at the time. And it's, I just don't think we'd get the same kind of responses. And my thought process was someone comes in and says, I describe my pain as black. And you look over here at the clinicians and they say, you know, 80% of them saying the color I give most often is black because that's because the patients don't want to see it in their shoe. Like you're giving them someone something that's the color of their pain. I don't feel like that's the play. Um, we also know that, you know, if someone has a really strong affiliation to a football club, um, then that football club has a rival. You might not want to make the colour. Yeah, you know, if we're talking elite sports here, for example, I'll, I'll use football because I don't have uh, enough AFL knowledge anymore. I did yeah. once upon a time, but it's it's got a bit off. But you know, say you saw a Manchester United player, you wouldn't give them an insole that was sky blue because that's the colour of Manchester City. So mm -hmm. you know, like that would just make sense. Um, so I just feel like colour is worthy of more consideration when we're writing these prescriptions than it's getting, but I can't prove it yet. So it's work that we've done. It's work that will sit on our desk for eternity. Hmm. And it's work that at some, at some point we need to work out, you know, where we go with it and how we do it. But yeah. Um, 
that's where I'm at with colour. So yeah, going, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I went off on a tangent. You can see this is and where I'm coming. Oh, it's true. Cool, I don't want to, did want to ask, because I, after I'd never thought of it ever in my whole life. And when I very first started as a new graduate, it was just get black, they get a second pair, get blue, so they can tell the difference. And I never thought anything about it until I saw you post about it. And now I, I do try to consider, or even just ask them what colour they think would be best. Because I don't know, they like it more, they'll wear it more, I don't know, something like that. But it's just good to raise the question, it seems. It's good to talk about, isn't it? And it may be nonsense, but here's the thing, like the, the, the colour green is associated with health and vitality. You look at the colour of the pharmacy side, is that yeah. pharmacy again? I'm, I'm going to keep crowbarring it back in. Yeah. You look at the <laughs> You know, you 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 think of the colour black and people associate it with the plague or death or mm. decay. You think of a skull and crossbones on a pirate ship. You know, imagine you check. I always say I say this in presentations I give. You check into a hotel. You suddenly, you know, cut your foot open in the shower. You run down to reception, say, can I get the first aid box? And they hand you a black box with a black cross on it. That's <laughs> a completely different a real different vibe than a green box with a green cross on it. So like, let's yeah. not pretend that colour isn't important in our lives. I just don't know how important or if it's important in orthoses, but I I don't think we're in a position where we can write it off. So it's, um, you can tell you've, you've tapped into the, the area I'm passionate about here, but the, the students I'm currently overseeing, because the original question here was what you're up to. So I apologise, I've gone <laughs> off on one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're overseeing. I've got a couple of students, uh, three students, and we're overseeing their master's projects. I teach on the master's degree. I'm in clinic two and a half days a week. Yeah. Um, and then I'm trying to juggle being a good parent slash father, husband, and trying to sort of try to log about 50, 60, 70 K a week running. So that's 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 why I'm not sitting down and doing too many Instagram graphics at the moment, I'm afraid. Yeah, but you'll be back. A, a mighty return. And then you'll be in everyone's Instagram comments, just in these big, long-winded replies that take hours and hours. <laughs> That's what you love to do late at night, I'm sure. There was a time when I did spend many an hour in, in the comments of various social media <laughs> platforms, uh, picking fights. It's fun, right? And and I was younger and I had more time and I had more energy. I'm, I'm the grumpy old man that shouts at clouds now, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why I need, that's why we need young people like you guys coming along going, yeah, like pass the baton. You, You've got the you've got the energy. Pick the fights. You know, go yeah. get out there and get stuck in. Yeah. And I've just been like, I'll do a big long winded comment, call them out, and say if you've got any issues, and I just put your email and say please forward all. <laughs> of this yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, beautiful. All right, mate. Thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.